All right, everyone. Well, good afternoon. My name is Mark Bono, and I'm a physical therapist and owner of Lake Washington Physical Therapy in West Seattle. Today, we are excited to bring to you Dr. Stuart Kerr from Orthopedic Specialists of Seattle. Dr. Kerr will be sharing with us how he achieves victory in neck and spinal surgery. We know that one of the keys for a successful surgical outcome is selecting the right patient and the right surgery. Dr. Kerr will explain why not everyone who has neck arthritis is a candidate for a surgery or a fusion. He'll share his insights on how he decides to operate and when he chooses to uh, move toward conservative care. In addition to his spinal surgery specialty, Dr. Kerr is also skilled in trauma and fracture repair, uh, and as well as joint replacement. And if we're lucky, we may also see some of Dr. Kerr's medals from some of his Ironmen that he's, uh, he's ran in the past. Also of note, Dr. Kerr is a decorated US Navy combat veteran with extensive wartime field surgery experience. We'd like to extend a big thank you for your service and sacrifice for our country, Dr. Kerr. So before we get started, uh, if people have questions, you can click on the uh, questions button or the raise hand button at the bottom of the screen. And I'll be tabulating uh, some of those questions uh, to share with the audience uh, at the end of the uh, webinar. And please reference a slide uh, or an area of the, uh, the presentation so we can uh, quickly address that um, with Dr. Kerr's Q&A. Um, so, all right, well, let's uh, hand it over to Dr. Kerr. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate the intro. So, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my talk today is, a, is titled Achieving Victory with Neck and Spine Surgery Guidelines for the Win. And I'm a orthopedic specialist at the Orthopedic Specialists of Seattle. Uh, a little bit of disclosures here, uh, nothing that uh, co conflicts with the content of this, of this talk whatsoever. And a little background for me, I think uh, that was a really nice introduction, Mark, I appreciate that. I'm a Seattle native, I was born and raised here. I'm married uh, and my wife and I have two sons and one pup. I did uh, serve in the, in the Navy for almost 30 years on active duty. And I really still, uh, one of the big reasons that I'm interested so much in medicine is that it's a very service oriented uh, field. And I, I really like to, to serve. I also, uh, I'm active in volunteering with the ski patrol and with uh, Divers Alert Network. I'm board certified and I'm fellowship trained. I've uh, completed a orthopedic and neurosurgical combined uh, spine surgery fellowship that was at the Thomas Jefferson University and the Rothman Institute. And then I also uh, uh, did a uh, fellowship in trauma and reconstruction at UCSF at their Fresno campus, which is the busiest level one trauma center in, in California. Um, I think Mark already had uh, discussed my surgical interests, uh, comprehensive cervical and back surgery, as well as total hip and knee replacements and fracture repair. For me, uh, a, a big part of my practice is uh, obtaining the highest quality surgical outcomes uh, possible. And that has always been a very uh, keen focus of mine. So let's get into the, uh, the bulk of this study. So just to refresh you, uh, some basic anatomy is that uh, on a bony perspective, you have seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, down here in the lumbar section, which is an area that commonly wears out, we have uh, five lumbar vertebrae, and then the back portion of the pelvis is this sacrum, and then the uh, terminal end of the bony axial skeleton is the coccyx. And as you can imagine, in addition to these bony elements that I'm pointing to on the screen here, there's a lot of uh, soft tissue structures to include the spinal cord, nerve roots, nerve within the uh, spinal canal, and then there's motion segments that between all of these uh, vertebrae, which are comprised of the disc and ligaments. And those wear out just like any other aspect within uh, the musculoskeletal system with time in many individuals. Largely what I'm seeing when patients come in to see me in the office is that they're starting to experience neck or back pain. And many of those patients are also struggling with uh, functional difficulties. They're having difficulty walking, perhaps arm pain or weakness, gait instability. Commonly, it's not just chronic neck or back pain alone. 
because most of the time those uh, really don't need surgical management. But we'll, we'll get into some uh, treatments that they uh, uh, can uh, undergo. Oftentimes when the patients are coming in, it does require a very comprehensive approach to them. I'm, you know, these are things that we've all uh, learned back during our medical training, you know, onset, OPQRST, how the, symptoms, how the symptoms are limiting to them. And a really key thing for me is I wanna know what, what we're hoping to accomplish during the visit. And oftentimes for, uh, for many of my patients, they're just trying to figure out what's causing the pain and make the pain go away so they can get back to a very active uh, life and maintain their health. For part of these uh, visits when they come in, I really have to initially, when I see these patients, rule out any of the, uh, the big red flag items. Uh, just this week, I saw someone in the office that had pretty significant trauma in their neck back in, uh, in September. Uh, where they had a, uh, a chronically neglect neglected um, uh, fracture, an unstable fracture within their neck. I also want to find out whether these patients have any bladder or bowel dysfunction, uh, what if, whether they're having some difficulty with their, with their uh, balance and maybe falling. And then we also sort out whether they're having anything that might suggest a tumor, aggressive neurologic decline, these sorts of things. Because these, these uh, uh, situations here oftentimes require a more urgent workup, traumatic instability, infection, tumor, essentially things that are causing uh, a progressive neurologic decline, even caught equina syndrome. So in those situations, we may not have uh, the benefit of time to be able to optimize these, these patients for surgical management. But by and large, most patients can be surgically optimized, and that's a very big part of my practice. I want to uh, understand what's causing the functional or the walking difficulties. And I also am really trying to assess what their exercise tolerance might be, how frail they may be, you know, whether there's some of these other uh, items that I know have to be managed and controlled very well and optimized pre-surgically in order for us to achieve a really good outcome. For example, if I take someone to the operating room and they're morbidly obese and they become infected, deep within their spine and develop osteomyelitis, which is a deep bone infection of the spine, well, I didn't really help them at all. Likewise, if someone's on a lot of opioids and I can't control their pain well after the operation and they're just staying in bed developing ulcers, that I didn't help them by doing a surgery. We all learn this uh, at many of our meetings. We look at these frailty indexes, we look at these Nesquip calculators, we look at these different things that we know, such as BMIs, nutrition, psychological stresses, osteoporosis, and they all uh, do have a very important role in the overall outcomes of these patients. But as you can see by some of these empty seats that, were, that, I, have, that I had taken photographs at at this recent meeting that I attended, uh, these aren't the you know the more you know, the sexiest parts of our job, but they're very important parts of our job. And I take it I, I hold these aspects really near and uh, and close to me because I think it's very important that we're ultimately helping and first uh, with these patients and and uh, not just doing procedures that potentially could cause harm. So <clears throat> these are the things that I'm really looking at, uh, making sure that that I recognize prior to ever taking someone to the operating room. I wanna know what their exercise tolerance is, what their reserve is. For example, me taking an, a person to the operating room, if they have poor pulmonary or cardiac disease that's unrecognized, I don't wanna figure that out in the middle of a procedure where I'm trying to help somebody and they're in the middle of uh, a procedure and they're having cardiac ischemia and potentially uh, even uh, perioperative death. I wanna make sure there's not neural, that, there, that there's not another cause for what's uh, occurring, such as uh, multiple sclerosis, other neurologic disorders. And I also have to assess these patients to ensure that there's not a uh, concomitant uh, joint disease, such as hip problems, shoulder problems, or uh, knee arthrosis, that's really the, the main culprit that's causing their pain. So it really requires a very thorough, thorough approach, comprehensive approach that I do feel as a uh, orthopedic surgeon that's kept a pretty broad skill set uh, makes me uh, particularly uh, effective at, at sorting out many of these problems. 
I'm trying to increase these patients' pre-surgical health. I want to control their bone density if it's frail. I want to make sure that there's not medications that they're taking that are going to cause renal impairment. And then when we add medications from the surgery and maybe fluid shifts from the surgery that we end up causing renal injury, I want to make sure that their cardiopulmonary systems are really optimized as best that we can in a pre-surgical uh, uh, rehab, which focuses a lot on uh, cardiac health and pulmonary health and functional reserve. When we evaluate these patients, when they have these big deformities, there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of uh, pre-surgical planning that plays a really big role, but a lot of times we have to about think also about the things that uh, perhaps uh, oftentimes can take a back seat. If someone doesn't have a high quality nutrition or if they're morbidly obese, we're going to see problems with that. We're gonna see problems with wound healing. We're gonna see problems with uh, healing of the constructs that we're putting together. So it's really important that we uh, have the experience to, to, to tease apart all of these very important issues uh, so that we can ultimately help our patients. And we really want to uh, ensure that we're providing a durable operation and not just doing something that perhaps uh, treats one level when there's three or four levels that are really problematic. For a lot of the uh, elderly patients, we still can treat them, but perhaps we have to do more of a staged approach for those patients rather than put them through a really uh, stressful, uh, larger surgery that they may not tolerate very well. And all of this becomes super important for our preoperative planning. It requires a lot of thought, it requires good experience, and it requires a lot of good clinical judgment to ensure that you're taking the, the proper patient to the operating suite in the first place. So this is just a quick little shot of, of someone that was even young and didn't have the nutrition that they needed and they didn't heal the stress fracture and required additional surgery. So this does play a role even in some of our younger patients, not just our older patients. You know, we've all been through uh, physical exam portions of it, and I, I kind of uh, like to think of the neurologic system in some ways as almost like a uh, the wiring in a system, like like in this engine here. These we know that there are certain uh, nerve roots that go to very specific areas, and essentially things need to correlate. They need to correlate with these imaging studies that oftentimes we don't really need to get right out of the gate, unless uh, there are uh, detectable objective uh, findings that we do see on these very thorough neurologic exams that, uh, that require us to evaluate for these uh, deficits that we may see. Most of the time we can wait uh, right out of the gate for these things. A lot of my initial care is a lot of education and re reassurance. I have many patients that are just scared. They come in and they, they wanna know what they can do. They're, they're perhaps fearful that their, uh, that their activities may worsen things to where they couldn't be repaired. And so I, I like to spend a lot of time on that. I like to spend a lot of time on lifestyle alter, alter, uh, alterations, such as if they're uh, eating a lot of processed foods that are pro-inflammatory. Uh, if they're using nicotine products, even smokeless tobacco, it's not going to allow uh, bones to heal together well, making sure that we have the, uh, the nutritional reserve and the dietary reserve to be able to heal these things. There's a lot of different cervical and lumbar traction techniques. And when I'm working on these patients, I'm also uh, really trying to encourage them to work on this cardiopulmonary optimization. So when I'm sending patients to therapy, for example, it's not just uh, a uh, focused on the on that small little area of pain. I'm really trying to optimize their cardiopulmonary health so that if they do need surgery down the road, we have some reserve to be able to get them through that. And here's one of the reasons that I, I, I am really uh, keen on providing these uh, cervical and lumbar traction techniques because as you can see in this diagram that I'm circling around here, if you have a, a high grade stenosis with an inflamed nerve root, and, and perhaps even we just give that nerve root a little bit more room through traction, knowing that it's going to you know, slump back at, down into that position, sometimes it can relieve some of the pain there and allow this uh, nerve root to calm down along with anti-inflammatory medication. 
this is typically my uh, my spinal pain management uh, plan. I, I am not a uh, fan of giving patients opioids for uh, for even severe pain. If they have severe pain, I'm typically putting them on a Medrol dose pack rather than opioids because I don't think that opioids are a, a sophisticated way of treating uh, musculoskeletal and, in particular, axial uh, uh, musculoskeletal. Uh, problems very effectively. So I'll use anti-inflammatories. A common one that I'll use that's tolerated well by most patients is meloxicam. I'll use um, methocarbamol or a cyclobenzapine, uh, acetaminophen if they need to augment their pain medications, gabapentin, get them going with physical therapy. And then again, getting them all into this uh, lifestyle modification things, which even includes some mindfulness and some uh, nutrition, some meditation, some really uh, uh, focusing on core strengthening, stretching, weight loss, tobacco cessation, all of these play a really significant role. And I'm also very open-minded for many of these patients for other adjuncts, dry needle stimulation, trigger point injections, steroid injections to augment things. I'm trying to use a very multimodal approach, realizing that there's many people that are on this spinal health care team. And I'm, I, I try to keep a very, very open mind uh, while I'm trying to optimize these patients from a cardiopulmonary perspective, because some of these patients will, will convert and maybe won't need re, uh, surgical management if some of these multimodal uh, treatments are effective for them. Well, just like with fractures as seen here, and I do a lot of fracture work, there are also some, some spine conditions, as you see here, that just are not going to resolve with non-surgical management. If you have an acetabular fracture or a shattered elbow, we wouldn't expect therapy to fix that. And in a, and in a similar fashion, if someone has an infection or a tumor that's pushing on their spinal cord and causing neurologic uh, deterioration, they're, they're gonna require a trip to the operating suite often. And with surgery, there are some things that we also uh, should consider that are contemporary and effective at, uh, again, optimizing their, their uh, post-surgical course. One of the recent things that we've uh, began employing is an erector spinae block uh, performed by our anesthesiologist staff here in the using ultrasound and, and delivering medication at multiple levels right by the transverse process. This has been very effective at cutting down our opioid use. And then even post-surgically, if someone has you know, larger incisions or perhaps they've had prior surgery where the healing maybe could be uh, potentially compromised, we could use some incisional wound vacs to try to allow that to seal off more effectively and not have wound breakdown issues. What's nice about the field of spine surgery is there are just so many uh, effective ways and tools that we have now. You know, not everything with spine surgery has to uh, require these large open procedures. Certainly they have their role, but we do a lot of minimally invasive surgery through these little tubes or even endoscopic surgery now, which can be very effective. I'd like to go into a few example cases and <clears throat> share uh, some of uh, my experiences with uh, uh, taking care of these patients over the years. This first patient is a 53-year-old uh, uh, male who had a chronic neck uh, pain, gait instability, progressive hand, hand numbness, really was experiencing uh, neurologic deterioration. Their, uh, their past history was significant for a, uh, a mid-cervical spine fracture, you know, two and a half decades prior. And on exam, this patient was really presenting with a... Uh, a picture that was consistent with myelopathy. They were having gait instability, hand numbness, arm numbness. Was They were really uh, spastic with their legs and a lot of hyperreflexia. And when we look at their imaging, we can see that they have this kyphotic angulation to their neck and over here, a little white stripe within the spinal cord, which was essentially knocking over this, over this little uh, bump within the spine and dragging over that. It was uh, stenotic, giving them myelopathy. And again, this patient underwent a surgical management with a corpectomy to remove that bone, realign the spine, and ultimately did quite well. This next patient uh, had a 
HGLSS is a high-grade lumbar spinal stenosis, and this was a 59-year-old female, uh, the uh, spouse of a uh, retired U.S. Navy Master Chief while I was on active duty, and she had a lot of symptoms that were really uh, just correlating with this uh, high-grade lumbar stenosis and uh, really struggling with any kind of uh, mobilization to the point where she was really uh, almost in a wheelchair most of the time. And you can see here that she uh, had a, a CT myelogram done. This surgery was done by another uh, uh, member in the community, but she came in to see me for an opinion. And the dye, the contrast dye, as you can see here, just does not go through. There's dye from down below, there's dye from here, but uh, you know, a lot of residual stenosis causing a napkin ring like this little picture here uh, around the nerve roots that are transversing through that aspect of the, uh, of the spinal canal. And then she additionally had a non-union of her, of her spine back here. She was diabetic. So <clears throat> that patient underwent a, a large decompression and stabilization procedure. And uh, we put in this implantable bone stimulator to, especially given her, uh, prior uh, non-union and she was able to get up out of the wheelchair and uh, they were just so uh, so much in tears in, in, their, uh, in their gratefulness that uh, we were able to get them moving again and they can enjoy their uh, the retirement years. This case here, this is a, a scoliosis case and these, these cases uh, classically carry a very high complication rate. The 69 year old uh, male, many, many years of progressive truncal imbalance, and over the past 18 months or so, wasn't really able to walk more than about 25 meters. Uh, kind of this difficulty with horizontal gaze looking down towards the ground, shifted off to one side, really uh, uh, in a lot of pain. As you can imagine, you know, standing and kind of angling your back forward like that for the majority of the day, having these muscles, these postural muscles try to keep you upright, despite having this big structural anomaly, it's very difficult for these patients, especially when you couple that with this, this high grade pressure on nerve roots as is seen here. So these patients require very extensive surgeries and not everybody is a good candidate for it. You have to really sort out and make sure that you pre-surgically optimize these patients so that, they can, so that you can safely get them through these procedures and out the other end that they actually, uh, that it was worth doing. And that's what we uh, were able to achieve with this patient through careful, methodical uh, pre-surgical optimization, get them through the surgery, and it was a life changer for them. This next patient, we just have a couple more of these, and then we'll open it up for questions. This was a patient that had uh, really substantial neck arthritis, and with that had cervical spondylotic, which basically means neck bones, spondylotic arthritis and then myelopathy is pressure on the on the spinal cord leading to nerve and spinal cord deterioration. This patient was falling down, weak legs, weak arms, gait disturbance. And as you can see from this MRI sagittal image here, really had this accordion-like compression on the spine. Certainly going through this elderly patient and doing multi-level anterior wasn't necessary. I was able to relieve the pressure off the, off the spinal uh, column from decompressing and shaving away the arthritis on the backside and then stabilizing that. And that patient uh, went on to uh, have market in, improvement and was able to uh, really uh, enjoy uh, some return of improvements in gait and, and diminished falling. This is an interesting case that looks at new, new technology. Not everybody requires a, uh, a fusion, of course, and this patient had uh, some weakness in the right arm and the dorsal hand, and you know a big soft disc herniation here, and uh, was able to undergo a, uh, a a disc replacement rather than a fusion following the decompression, and went on to do well. Some patients we can just open up the back part of the uh, spinal column and and tease out uh, some of this herniated disc. So not everybody requires an operation for that. <clears throat> Occasionally we'll see someone that's had surgery and isn't doing well 
And uh, one of the reasons that I will get these flexion extension x-rays is to help sort out whether there's adjacent segment instability or perhaps even some micro instability at an area that was operated on before. And this patient had a lot of uh, neck pain three and a half years out and was kind of written off by some of the community surgeons. But if you look at this critically, you can see this little, this little essentially like a little fracture line coming through here where you had a, a non-healing pseudarthrosis or non-union following this two-level anterior cervical decompression infusion procedure. And this patient uh, went on to do really well after we, we remedied that with, uh, with additional surgery. So to summarize, I would say that most spinal problems really are self-limiting. Uh, oftentimes, if we uh, are able to get uh, a multidisciplinary approach to uh, remedying many of these uh, with medications, multimodal treatment, traction, physical therapy, aerobic uh, improvements, weight loss, tobacco cessation, they really do quite well, but some do need surgery. For those that require surgery, uh, we really don't have to jump on these, uh, these advanced imaging unless we really have symptoms that are going on for some time or if we suspect some of those red flags that I had earlier discussed. Tumor, fracture, infection, cauda equina syndrome, those sorts of uh, uh, scenarios oftentimes will uh, result in deterioration. So uh, seeing the patients back regularly and, and, and re-examining them is quite important. Uh, for any type of corrections, it does require a lot of planning, just like for my fracture work. I can't just go into this and, uh, and wing it on the fly. <clears throat> the same thing happens with all of these works. You know, this this is a patient that uh, presented to me uh, about a year ago, and you know they, the surgical plan didn't include other areas where he was uh, highly stenotic. So, you know, I would expect that a two-level fusion from L4 to the sacrum wouldn't really fix him. He never really got that much better following his operation, and he needed a surgery that was much more extensive to resolve some of the foraminal stenosis and the adjacent segment problems that he was already presenting with when he underwent the surgery. So the planning really is, an, is a key part of this. What's causing the pain? Let's make sure that, we, that we're addressing all those segments in, a, uh, in an effective level. And sometimes it requires staging it out. We can't take any of this stuff to the operating room without a good plan behind us. And then the same thing goes for, uh, for spinal uh, intervention as well. So this is kind of a, a, an interesting uh, little certificate that one of my patients gave me. And it's, uh, it's, she had a really complex uh, uh, condition that I treated. And uh, she um, gave me this, uh, this old adage that I had heard quite a few times when I was uh, uh, back in the, in the Navy, especially from some of our salty chief petty officers. And it's called the seven Ps. So, and it just basically says uh, proper prior <clears throat> proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. And I think that that's kind of funny because when I was back in my SEAL team days before going to medical school, we had to plan everything out very, very uh, elaborately. We had to think about the what ifs, what happens if this occurs during the mission. And we really had, it, had to have it dialed so that we knew how the team was going to react if, if, if things went awry during some of our missions. And we have to do, and so there's a lot of similarities with that when I'm doing these larger con reconstruction type of uh, scenarios with my patients. And with that, I will open it for, uh, for questions. I will say that if we really want to accomplish these, uh, these, these, these medals of superior performance, it requires a, uh, a, a very, a skilled and thorough assessment for these patients and not just whipping them to the operating room and uh, doing uh, surgery that, uh, that is for the sake of, uh, of correcting small things. We really have to sort all this stuff out and optimize them, especially for the more extensive uh, operations that are required for some of our aging patients. Thank you. Uh, that, that was great, Dr. Kerr. Uh, th thank you so much for, uh, for, for sharing that. And uh, um, I knew we could count on getting some pictures of uh, some of your medals, um, of all, all your medals you've, uh, you've acquired along, uh, along the way. So um, a, a couple questions coming in. Um, 
And I actually, I'll, I'll just may make a comment too. I really appreciate hearing about all the steps that you go through uh, with uh, surgical optimization. I mean, I've, I've talked with numerous you know, surgeons in the past, and I think a lot of the therapists and, and uh, medical providers on this, uh, this webinar have as well. And it's not always something that uh, is, is talked about. It's more about what technique and where are the clinical signs and where are the, you know, what, what, what type of the surgery is happening. Um, but we don't always get into the decision making, you know, really almost cherry picking the right candidate to, to have the most successful outcome. And so I really appreciate hearing all that goes into uh, that decision making process from you, because uh, I think that's that's really what in a lot of cases can set the uh, the outcome apart from another another surgeon or another another uh, patient having a surgery um, elsewhere is to, to, to make sure you get things optimized first. Um, what you mentioned a lot of different things you look at uh, in terms of uh, maybe making sure they're on the right track before you decide to do a, a surgery on somebody you think you can help. What, what are one or two things that are really, you know, almost non-negotiables that, that really have to be uh, in place that, that um, with, with enough planning and uh, attention um, you feel are, are really game changers to have patients uh, have dialed in before you operate on them? I think one of the uh, key things for spinal surgery in particular, especially elective spinal surgery, is, is being off of all nicotine products. I, I don't think that uh, uh, someone that's going to undergo a, an elective spinal surgery for degenerative conditions, uh, especially if it's a, a fusion type of procedure, uh, should be on uh, any, any nicotine exposure whatsoever. That uh, there's good evidence in the literature that that won't uh, result in a good outcome. Uh, I would say another thing is uh, opioid use. So if I have a patient that comes in and it's for an elective procedure and they're already on high levels of, uh, of opioids, I really want them to uh, you know, work with a pain management specialist or with their primary care provider to try, try to wean those way down, if not even off through a multimodal approach, because it's it, it, you know, if we could treat the pain with the opioids, then there's probably not a big value in doing the surgery. And, and the idea is to get them off those because they're not safe to be using for a long term uh, for those kind of conditions. And I would say that the third one is probably the, uh, the obesity uh, uh, aspect. Technically, that makes the uh, surgery so much more challenging. There's a lot more weight on the uh, table while they're positioned. So they can end up with you know, palsies and skin breakdown and complications from uh, more time in the operating room. And uh, I really, you know, want their BMI ideally to be less than 35 uh, for these things, especially for elective things. And, and what I find, Mark, is that if, 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 you, if you share with the patients the rationale for this and you don't just send them away and say, you got to lose weight, which I don't think is helpful, that doesn't give them any tools. You know, on a couple of these slides, like I, uh, I'll spend time with the patients. Like I'll, I'll get out my phone. And I'll say, look, have, do you have a Nutribullet? Um, you know, uh, or some type of a blender that you can blend up a lot of vegetables and you know spinach and maybe a little bit of uh, yogurt and a lot of water, not fruit juice, but a lot of water. Because if you do that for a meal or two, or even prior to a meal, you're going to eat more and you're going to lose weight. But I try to, it's, it's important for me that I give them a lot of tools and not just tell them what I want to do. I try to share the importance for this because patients will get it, in my opinion, uh, if, you, if you share the, the rationale. And it just takes a few more minutes for me to share the rationale with what I need them to do. I'm not really into setting up a bunch of hoops for them to jump through unless they're really necessary. But I will work with them uh, to to accomplish, accomplish those things. And uh, I can, to be quite honest with you, some of my biggest wins have been, uh, have been from someone that comes in and they're just in a horrible state. And we develop this, uh, this mutual um, uh, trust and I walk them through this pathway to get them to the point where I can repair them and it changes their lives more. So, for me, that's uh, that's really really rewarding work. Well, th th thank you for sharing that. That's uh, that's very insightful. And uh, again, I appreciate you uh, being you know really an educator 
uh, and, and, and guiding these patients, um, you know, through, through, through the process of, you know, make, making the decision to have the, have the surgery. Yeah. Um, another question that came in uh, a little more technical question, uh, regarding, uh, fusions. Um, is there any data that you look at, um, or that you can share with the, the audience about, uh, the, the adjacent level, uh, disease when it comes to, um, having a, having a fusion and, and the, the time that, that a lot, a lot of times, uh, the adjacent level, uh, instability may, may, um, um, you know, kind of rear its ugly head, so to speak. Uh, it's something that I think as PTs, we, we see downstream after, after fusions, uh, from time to time, but I just lo love to hear your thoughts and the question that came in from the audience. Yeah, I think that's a, uh, I think that that's an excellent question and I, it's one that I face every single day when I'm in the office and it I, I think that's really what's really important with that is that there's a, a lot of good information that's now coming up that uh, sometimes we uh, you know as surgeons certainly can create these problems if we're not you know, placing the spine back into a uh, you know, a, a neutral position, for example. So there was that case that I showed you where, you know, the a fusion was done, a two-level fusion was done. But if you look critically at those x-rays, uh, that wasn't really, uh, uh, I didn't, uh, when I look at that x-ray, I wouldn't have expected that that would have been a durable operation. So <clears throat> if you leave a, uh, a reconstruction at a segment where there's already a lot of pressure and stenosis on a nerve root, um, I think that you're just asking that patient to come back in probably months later, if they even get better, uh, to, to have the next level done, to have the next level done. So <clears throat> we know that uh, the fusion certainly can uh, contribute to adjacent level stresses, but what we will have to be really careful for uh, within uh, our, you know, our discipline is to make sure that we're not uh, uh, placing patient's spine in a position where we could accelerate that because we haven't you know, treated enough or we haven't uh, uh, really brought them back to a, a stable uh, level in their, uh, within their spine you know, in treating the segments that really are contributing to uh, a lot of pressure on nerve roots. Yeah, th thank you, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I have another, uh, I guess, a technical question uh, coming in regarding m m motor weakness. So when you have somebody that comes in that uh, looks like they could be a surgical candidate from, you know, probably a decompression type of a procedure, and they have, you know, pretty significant motor weakness, uh, let's say maybe one, one myotome, perhaps two myotome, you know, what, what, when you, when they ask you, hey, doc, will I ever get my strength back? You know, um, will I get this, 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 bounce back in my, my calf or will I, will I be able to, to have my grip back? What, what, what do you go through in terms of what information do you need or how do you answer those questions? I do tend to think that patients can really have some improvement. Certainly it depends on how long uh, they've had uh, this deficit for. Mm -hmm. If someone has a deficit for years and years and uh, you know, gross atrophy at the muscle, that's gonna be a much more challenging thing for someone to recover from. But that muscle tissue is still alive. And there's, there's a good book that I share with a lot of my patients uh, that uh, a UCSF uh, researcher by the name of Michael Mirzanich uh, has uh, uh, written and it's called Softwired. And I do think that uh, this uh, concept of neuroplasticity is, is a very real thing. There's good evidence to suggest that. Um, and it's a large part of what you guys are, are doing as well with blood flow restriction, TENS unit, you know, activation, uh, really trying to, you know, reconnect that brain to nerve to muscle neuromuscular junction. So, you know, that tissue, uh, it, so long as there wasn't like a, a you know, a, a clipped nerve or something like that, people can recover from these and certainly can become quite functional again. But if it's a long-standing deficit, it's going to take a lot of it's going to take a lot of homework. Yeah, I think that there's there's probably this balance of giving the patient some hope, but also some realism in terms of you know the the, the chronicity of the situation. Um, yeah, and kind of balancing that. And at the end of the day, you know, we don't always know how 
how, how strong that calf could, could, could get, but you have to, you have to work it and give it as much stimulus as possible to. Yeah. To, to yeah. Get but it's, but it's, it's hard to predict on an individual level. So yeah. I, I like to uh, say, look, you know, I think that we should, you know, if it's a high grade stenosis that's causing this, why don't we give that, uh, that nerve muscle junction every chance to get you back to the strongest level that we can. Yeah. And, you know, I know that if that was the situation with me, I'm a very active person. I, like skiing, bicycling, and all these things, I, I would want to, uh, you know, re essentially remove the the structural problem and get working on that right away. Yeah, great. Uh, well, before uh, before we uh, um, we end the webinar, I just want to um, uh, thank you for your for your time and just your contribution to you know our our learning and and uh, everybody that's that's uh, viewing the webinar. Um, can you just share with us a few a few highlights from um, your Navy SEAL days and and kind of walk us back? To, I mean, you don't you don't uh, talk to Navy uh, Navy SEALs too often, or people that have had experience with Navy SEALs. So uh, I'd love to, to love to learn a little more about that and then how that, yeah. that moved you into the field of medicine. Uh, probably teamwork more than anything else. I mean, the 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 really uh, cool thing about uh, having. Uh, done that in my earlier years is you just learn this um, this really really high level teamwork where the stakes are very high, and and for me it's uh, that's what I really try to build around me in my care of patients. You know, if you if you have a team that you're able to you know train together and work together and and uh, get to the point where. Um, most of the members of that, if not every member of that team knows what the other person's job is quite well, it's, it's amazing the things that you can accomplish and, and uh, you know, the good deeds that you can uh, achieve. So I think in a general sense, that, that was the, uh, you know, a, a really exciting part about being within that organization. And I would say the second thing is just the adventure. I mean, we really did a, a lot of exciting things. I, uh, you know, did a lot of parachuting, a lot of diving, a lot of, you know, uh, you know, work with deployments, and, you know, being in very challenging different situations uh, on all sorts of continents. And uh, I wouldn't trade that for anything. It, it really uh, has a, um, has had a, a, a very positive impact in, in my development. And um, it's, a, you know, really a huge level of pride for me. You know, having having come from that background and to be able to apply some of those concepts in in my ever, my everyday life today. Great. Well, well, thank you again for your for all of your service and um, your sacrifices that you've given. Uh, you know, for all of us to 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 do what we're doing, and um, it's really a, a treat to know that you're um, you're you know a local a local doc in the, in the community, and uh, you'd be a great resource for us, um, you know, and we're working on, uh, you know, trying to improve the lives of our patients that we have in our clinics uh, each and every day. So um, I know you flashed on some of the, uh, the contact information, you know, where your office is at and, and how to get in touch with you, but uh, any other, uh, um, you know, LinkedIn or emails or uh, ways that people can, uh, can connect with you uh, and learn more? Yeah, probably the best way, honestly, is uh, through my website. So it's just my name, stuartkerrmd.com, and that has uh, a, an easy way to, for patients to schedule appointments. Uh, it's an easy way for uh, people to learn about, uh, you know, my background, review patient testimonials, um, look at, uh, you know, my outcomes, look at, uh, you know, some of the educational pieces that we've kind of discussed today. So awesome. Well, that's probably the best way that in the office. I mean, the office numbers are there too, but all that stuff's on the website. And I'm, okay. I'm really trying to constantly build that as a resource for people. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you again. And I uh, appreciate all the attendees uh, for uh, um, uh, tuning in today. And uh, yeah, uh, have a great day. Thanks for having me, Mark. I really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. All right. See you guys. Bye-bye.